with a lot of pain to inflict on others for your own enrichment. That game is over, and a new game's about to begin. This is not retribution. It's a reawakening. How much time do I have? Months, at best. I still have a lot of work that needs to be done. You don't often get an opportunity to develop a guy uh, over such a long period of time. This is John Kramer's story. It's a window into a particular period in his life. One of the things I love about the Saw franchise is its ability to intermingle stories over the course of several films. And it was important for us, me and Pete, as we set off to do another Saw film, this would have been our second at the time, to try to intermingle our story, the Jigsaw story, with the older film. We talked a lot about how it was our desire to make a film that feels more like the early Saw movies in terms of simplicity on the one hand, where we don't have to worry about convoluted time tricks, but also just to be able to focus on John's character. I don't suppose you can tell me how it looks, can you? Unfortunately, I'm just the technician. And this movie we set out, the very first document we have written in January 2018, so five years ago from where we're sitting here right now, it was called Saw 9, John Kramer. After Jigsaw, we were working on a, a script, which was this story. And Chris Rock came to us and he said, I love your Saw movies. He said, I've always wanted to be in one. And then we got a call that Chris Rock wanted to talk about being in a Saw movie, and then everything was put on hold. And we had to scrap what was going to be Saw 9, which is now Saw 10. When Chris Rock came in with the, the spiral script, and he had an open window of availability. We kind of shifted gears and we did that movie, but we knew we were gonna come back to this script. So we had to wait about two and a half years before we revisited the story, although Pete and I were working on it throughout that entire process, knowing that it would probably wind up getting made one day. For years, I have pitched the idea of let's do Saw Zero, meaning a Saw movie taking place before Saw 1. So the character of Jigsaw is alive, and there are stories that happen prior to the story that we learned in Saw 1. You know, one of the things about the Saw timeline is that in there are many movies where we do have, from a current time movie, a flashback to something that happened not in a previous movie, but in that time frame. And it was always very complicated because we always had to try to figure out as we were going through the franchise, as each movie came up, like, well, so when did this happen? And what happened afterwards? And where were they in between this? And what would they have looked like? And how much time would have gone by? So how much can we justify in different haircuts or different, you know, wardrobe or any of that kind of thing? And then that eventually morphed with our producers and our writers, the idea of let's do a Saw movie with Tobin Bell, with Jigsaw, that takes place prior geographically of Jigsaw dying. We started talking to Tobin and he started talking about epigenetics. And we started talking about that amazing scene in Saw 6 with William Easton when Tobin goes to the insurance company in order to try to get funding so that they'll pay for a very experimental surgery in Norway. This is a doctor in Norway. She injects what she calls suicide genes. There's an article about it into cancerous tumor cells then an inactive form of a toxic drug is administered and it kills off all the cancer cells that has these suicide genes in it. And that's where it all started to click and we realized that we could tie 
our film, Saw 9 at the time, not Saw X, but Saw 9, we could tie Saw 9 to Saw 6. Philosophically, when I approach a Saw film, I want to do more of the kinds of things I've always liked about the franchise and frankly do less of the things that I wasn't so keen on. And um, I was pleased that there wasn't any police storyline. No cops in the story almost at all. Not that I think that that stuff was all bad in the earlier Saw films, but I just feel that, that it's, it's kind of routine and we see so much police stuff on television and in thrillers that uh, uh, it was very refreshing to see that this story is really just focused completely on John and the other, uh, the other characters. So that was, that was I thought, really smart and um, not, not something that I guided them about, but it's something that I'd always spoken about and um, uh, f feel, feel pretty strongly about it that, that the cops were starting to really bog us down. One of the major problems with Saw X, the thing that we were trying to deal with for as long as we had been developing the script, was how do we put John in jeopardy and feel that there's any jeopardy to John in jeopardy? We know he lives. We've seen Saw 2. We've seen Saw 3. We know Shawnee is in Saw 2 and Saw 3. There's no way anything bad could happen to them. How much can you threaten Tobin? when everyone knows he's gonna, he, the, the fans know he lives. But the original idea was, we have to have Jigsaw be like Superman, which is nothing can happen to Superman, but we are always worried about Lois, right? And so we need to create a character that the audience and Jigsaw is actually very concerned about. Mark and Oren and Twisted have always kind of had a policy, we're not putting kids in danger. Come along to Saw X. John, who is that? A friend. And a terrible, unforeseen consequence. For me, the, the emotion that's involved in him realizing that he's done a screw up and this very nice kid that he's kind of befriended is now in danger because of him. And I don't think anybody's going to see that coming. <laughs> it's just not right. It's not right. And that's where the kid came in. And somebody pitched it, and there was an initial reaction, no, no, we can't put a kid in, 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 any, in any kind of trouble. And then, you know, I brought up the idea of Halloween and the little kid and hereditary with the decapitation and like, spoiler alert, sorry. And all of these things, and we realized, okay, this is the way to do it. Um, and it really does add in a completely different element to the film. When that little kid gets placed on that bloodboarding board and you're watching him suffer. And not only that, but you're seeing him care about John and t t pulling it to create havoc for himself just to save John. And then John feeling the intense amount of guilt that this little child is suffering. It added a whole other dimension to the story and it really came about from months and months and months of banging our heads against the wall trying to figure out how to put John in jeopardy. This is closer to the bone uh, because uh, John is uh, very much involved in the central situation that's going on. He can save you. Is that your concern? Saving me? There are other victims of these crooks, thieves, liars, scammers, criminals. Who are those 34 people to you? John's case was different. Did you heal any of those 34 people? John is way closer to what's happening in Saw X than he has ever been before. Tobin Bell is a hero of mine. I flip and love that guy so much. He is so smart about the character of John Kramer, which he is the, the premier expert on. We pitched the movie to, to Tobin before we set out to do it and he loved the idea, and he, he actually embellished and, and brought us a bunch of stuff to the, to the script. And then as every Saw movie, Tobin pretty much writes his own dialogue. So sitting with, with Tobin, he's always coming up with ideas. 
One of the very, very first ideas that he came up with, and I'm giving him full credit for it because I thought it was pretty genius. We were talking about the, the group of, of scammers, the, 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 the grifters, and in regular parlance, it's called phishing. Um, and John Kramer, said Tobin, would relate the idea of phishing to fishing in a stream and, and catching prey. And he started just vamping on, on that line. You know, when I was a kid, my uncle used to take me fishing. Each lure attracted a different kind of fish. You went fishing too, didn't you, Cecilia? I think Tobin was, uh, was really impressed by how much this story truly immerses itself in his character, in his emotional journey. The reality is, I'm dying. I am dying. You have to face that. But our work's not gonna end. And I'm trust trusting you to carry on. He's just the luckiest thing that happened to the Saw franchise. I still don't know exactly how they came to him, but I just know that, thank God they did, because he's such a big part of the longevity of this franchise, because he he fills everything out. So, of course, as an actor, he, uh, he saw this, I'm sure, as kind of his life's great work. <laughs> Artistically speaking, I mean, this is his biggest movie by far. I'd almost venture to say that Tobin Bell has more screen time in this movie than in... Any two can buy. Any three, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Tobin Bell is, is the protagonist, is driving every scene of this movie. He, he, he's in the, the entire he, movie. He opens the movie. He opens the movie. He's in the movie longer than any other movie, and he closes the movie. One of my favorite parts of this entire process is turning in a script and feeling like, oh, we nailed it. We, 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 we nailed that John voice. Oh, boy, people are going to be so psyched. I'm going to give you an opportunity to do something significant with your life. And then Tobin does his pass, and we sit down with him, and he just starts kind of just riffing on little words, on little moments, and it blows out into something that we're able to use for the script, and it's always... It's always just such an exciting moment for us. It all starts with the writing, and the script uh, for this particular film is very strong, perhaps one of the strongest Saw films. Think of the explosives as a sort of cancer, a malignancy that must be cut out for you to survive. Josh Stahlberg and Pete Goldfinger did a marvelous job, and when I first read the script, I was uh, very impressed with it, and... Uh, uh, it was in very, very good shape, very tight. My sun sets to rise again. Your sun is rising again, John. We will make sure of it. Our names are up on the screen as written by, but um, the process of writing a script, uh, you're really dealing with so many people, and Tobin is one of the most important. We don't kill. You chopped a fucking head off! Valentina died because she didn't have the will to live. She failed her test. I think that one of the really special things about the John Kramer character is how complicated he is as an individual. He's not just this put on a mask and walk after you and stab you in the neck. It's, that's not. It's, it's all mind and mental and emotional. You guys are fucking sick. We're sick. These people kill with false hope. There's a lot of irony in John Kramer's character. I mean, no doubt. That's that's the core of this of this whole Saw saga. And in the case of John accusing them of of killing with false hope, it's it's absolutely true that he's doing the same thing. But he doesn't know it, right? And and I know Tobin is a huge fan of that line. He pr he probably wrote it. He's a complex guy, and uh, we've been able to layer the Saw films with some concepts that originally came from James Wan and from Lee wan L, and we've been able to expand on those. And one of the great things about having an opportunity to work on this film, Saw X, was that for the first time, we really get to challenge John. How do we get this thing started? 
It's activated by the subject. Of course. Because you wouldn't be responsible for killing anyone, would you? Fucking hypocrite. You know, you can hide behind this moral code that you seem to have or you think you have, but you are the one that's designing these traps. You're the one that's pushing the buttons. And it really makes John have to do some soul searching in a way that I don't think we've seen as much of in some of the other films. This is not right. It's not right. Not really. Electoral moral decency from you. One of the things from the very beginning was the, f and we've had many, many conversations about this over the years, is what is Jigsaw's philosophy? And, and I always thought that the tagline, how much blood would you shed to stay alive, would always really kind of summed up the philosophy really well. But we have always, in creating the traps, followed the blueprint of the person can get out. We need to get her to a hospital. She won her game, and she deserves to live. It's not that it's unwinnable. It's just that they take too long. They procrastinate. OK, I need to take these things off. Somebody help me. What do I do? What do I do? It, it is until that clock starts to tick down to the last few seconds that they suddenly get that burst of energy and you know try to make it happen and that's why one of the most important elements of all of our traps has been the ticking clock and all of our traps there's a ticking clock not just in a imagery sense but in reality it's like there and that's what the person can look at and that's what can motivate them most people are so ungrateful to be alive it's, it's those little things that make us realize just how much depth there is to the character. Right now, Amanda, these people deserve to be tested. That lady doctor deserves nothing. Everyone deserves a chance, an opportunity to redeem themselves. You should know that more than anyone. I would be surprised if in my contract for this film, when I signed my initial writing contract, if, if it didn't state specifically that Amanda had to be in the movie for me to write the script. When I get out of here, I'm gonna kill both of you motherfuckers! That's a good plan. You're gonna wanna really listen carefully to the rules in order to pull that off. I love that character so much. Walking with a gun, get treated like a criminal. Shawnee is a dream. I, I, the needle pit to me is the greatest saw trap in the history of the franchise. That was her. And I was dying to write for that character. You'll make it so long as you keep your head. And it made sense because this is a deep dive into John Kramer. John Kramer's biggest relationship in the franchise is with Amanda. The pain just comes in waves. Listen, I'm not ready to do this without you. You're ready. And originally, Amanda wasn't really in it. And then we kind of realized that people would look at it. How's John Kramer doing all the stuff that he's doing? And we realized we needed to bring in somebody. I think it was then that Oren came up with the idea of, like, why don't we make the person who's disguised, why don't we make that Shawnee in the, the script? And then we'll reveal it at some point during the movie. Of course, why not? And also, who better, especially as she's starting to make the move into Saw 2 and her mindset, to challenge him on his beliefs because she breaks those, those, those rules. What? Sometimes we get sucked into things that are against our nature. Drugs are as vicious as they are powerful. We all have free will. Gabriella had her own free will. And if you can't handle this, how will you handle the rest of our work? So it gave a perfect opportunity to, for those two characters to play off of each other. Uh, one of my favorite little tiny moments is when uh, Gabriella says to him, He's a monster. He's going to kill you the same way he's going to kill all of us. You don't know, John. You know, of course, Amanda doesn't <laughs> think twice about this. But the fact is, Amanda dies because of John Kramer, and the audience knows it, that going into this movie, and so little things like that, I think, um, 
you know, they have subtext and irony and uh, justify why we, we would do something like bring the Amanda character back into the story because uh, there is there is something kind of creepy about knowing from the very beginning that John Kramer's gonna die and then you meet her. Amanda's tested three times really by John in Saw 1, 2, and 3 and the third one she outright fails and, and dies as a result. What I was faced with in coming back to Amanda all these years later, at this particular time and place, aside from just, you know, the physicality of it, it's an, it's an interesting time. And it's funny, we were just struggling with that because the writers are awesome. But the director, Kevin, and I realized the other day we had a break in shooting and he watched, got to watch some stuff. And he said, you know, what occurs to me is like, there was a sarcasm and kind of a hardness that isn't there at this time. Like that happens Saw 3, when she starts to question if John is messing with her, you know? We never really saw what went on with Amanda between Saw 1 when she's a very sort of emotionally destroyed drug addict and Saw 3 when she's downright sarcastic to John and, and highly questions everything that they've been doing and that ultimately they're giving their lives for. So I think in this story, we see a little bit of that, uh, of that early tension between the two of them, but we don't go anywhere near as far as we do in, in Saw 6. But at this point in time in, the, in their journey, it's like she's just in love, you know? Not in a creepy way, but her heart's like, thawed out and so you have the people involved and it's also like I mean we've set up the bathroom at this point but that's really it like these are the first real I could call them traps I know Tobin wouldn't challenges <laughs> but she really believes in the beauty that comes through suffering begging won't help trust me you're not the first to try and uh, Shawnee Smith uh, uh, developed the character uh, uh, at the beginning of uh, Saw One. Uh, she uh, is very important in John's life. Really though, I just wanted to see them on screen together doing their thing and showing their love for each other. I was really happy when Shawnee Smith was back in this one. She is such a fierce actor and she's so strong and vulnerable at the same time. And the way she portrays Amanda is, is uh, it's so complex. So the Cecilia character is meant to be a very smart, persuasive scientist from Norway and somebody who, again, to go back to this idea that we really wanted it to, to feel ironclad that John Kramer is justified in falling for, uh, for the scam. One of the things we were really cognizant of at the very beginning was it was incredibly important for Tobin that he was not dumb. He did not stumble into this and get tricked. My father, Dr. Finn Peterson, was forced into hiding by corrupt governments and their relationship to Big Pharma. And we needed somebody physically strong and also somebody mentally strong that could go toe to toe with Tobin. And you actually believe throughout the movie that she's gonna win. She's somebody that I think anybody would trust. She has beauty, she has warmth, and, um, and just there's a truthfulness to her. I have a few hobbies. Hmm. Let me guess. Classic car renovation. <laughs> <laughs> no? No. I, uh, I help people overcome inner obstacles. And so we really needed to find that in the actress who plays her. After I turned 40, I think I've basically only played villains, which is fun. It's super complex, super interesting. So this time it was, I thought it was so nice to, to be able to play a character who is uh, thoroughly sympathetic and warm and good. Not so much. <laughs> oh, come on, John. You the scary voice. I'd like to play a game. There were other people that we'd considered beforehand, but none of them quite had that 
and she needed to be at least Scandinavian, if not uh, Norwegian. So uh, I was watching this TV show Ragnarok on Netflix that's a Norwegian show, and she's on, and I'm like, that person is really good. And uh, so we reached out to her. She auditioned for the movie on tape. We saw it, we hired her. Oren was the first person to meet her in Mexico. And she's tall, she's exactly the part as we had, had imagined it. Acting in horror films is extremely difficult because you have to react to things that are not natural, maybe, or unimaginable or so extremely horrific that you, you wouldn't, you, you can't imagine. So how would you react if someone's head got cut off? When I was playing Cecilia, I was thinking about this all the time because she's a psychopath and psychopaths, they play human. Their reactions are not natural. They're constantly a play within the play as a character. I think she saw what what we were trying to do and was a, was a very willing participant. And uh, you know, it took it took some time to sort of find our way because we needed somebody who could be completely warm and empathetic and convincing, and then be revealed to be a fraud and like, oh, she's kind of bad. And then by the end of the movie, it's like, holy crap, this woman is wicked, <laughs> right? And in each of those categories, I thought she did a fantastic job. It's exciting. And she, uh, the spoiler alert, is that she is around at the end of Saw 10. Nobody can beat Jigsaw, so clearly something needs to happen to her down the road should we continue this franchise. Turn it on, Parker, and let's go. When we first meet Parker Spears, it's it's really just in passing, and you kind of assume that he's a character that's not going to come back. Parker says, John Kramer. Sorry, of cancer. I danced. You? Uh, Brian. Ah. Uh, <laughs> you in? We more or less believe, okay, he's in the same boat as John, and he figured out that she's a con artist, and, and here he is. That was one of the uh, things that attracted me to, to doing it, actually, is the fact that this guy comes in and presents himself as a guy who's been, you know, taken to the brink of, of despair. I gave her everything. All the money I had. That was for my family, that money. He is rightfully furious. And then, of course, the spoiler is that He's actually part of the whole setup in the first place. He never had cancer. We shifted him a bit from how he was written, where I think maybe in, the, in his original conception, once it's revealed that he's working with Cecilia, he was a little too fiendish and um, relished how, how evil <laughs> he and, and Cecilia as a, as a duo were. You, uh, you, you start off playing one character. Good luck, John. Thank you. And finish up playing another character altogether. So you play two different characters in the show. Uh, we both liked the idea of, of pulling that back a bit and, and making Parker himself be a little bit skeptical of, of just how evil we're, we're realizing Cecilia is by putting the boy Carlos into a trap. So I think that, that gives the character a lot more nuance to see that side of him. And, and God knows Stephen Brand really pulled it off. Arne and myself went to Mexico. We looked at hundreds and hundreds of tapes. And we narrowed it down, and we met with the people, uh, uh, the actors that we, we ended up casting. And uh, they're not good, they're phenomenal. Amazing. And uh, they, the local cast brought this movie to life. As it happens, the, the four of the main characters in this film were the first four actors that I met with. <laughs> and that never happens, you know? You audition lots and lots of people. And we did audition lots and lots of people for those four key roles of the Mexican characters. But they were just the best. No, 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 This is my first um, movie in English. So Tobin, it's a, a really good actor. So even in person, it's like, oh my God, you wanna kill me. <laughs> it's so strange. It's my um, health, 
help help me a lot, no, to to try to create the the character because she needs to speak English with him, and he is a big, big, big presence. Like, so it was easier than I thought. I have never seen an actress perform a saw trap <laughs> as passionately and believably and effectively as she did. It was it was almost uncomfortable to watch. She was so committed to. To, to selling the, 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 the kind of need and mental state that, that it takes to cut your own leg off. When I met him, I was like, I can't believe this guy is directing, you know, this kind of a movie because he's the sweetest guy in the world. Um, he's very concerned with, you know, the actors feeling safe all the time and feeling, um, and feeling you know, protected by, by, by the crew and by, you know, making sure that nothing goes wrong on set. And you would, if you saw him on the street, you would never believe that he's the guy that directs a Saw movie, you know? In, in the very first audition that I did with him, one of the first things he said was, why would I turn on this recorder? And I had to think about it, and I'm like, you know what, you're gonna get a blast of electricity in the back of your neck if you don't. He was thought about it, and he's like, okay. There's this thing there that says, play me, I'm not gonna touch that thing. <laughs> The other thing I really liked about him is that he was not afraid to play very, very pee in the pants terrified. And it is not easy to find male actors that are willing to go that far. So I, th I think that that side of the Mateo character, the, the whiny little bitch, gives great energy to all of the scenes where he's still alive in the, in the main test room. Mr. Kramer, please listen to me, I beg you. I beg you, please, please. He kind of... Even though he's like screaming and like having a very, very bad time, the whole, the whole movie, almost the whole movie, he has this um, lightness in the way he does things that you almost feel like a relief when he's doing, when, when he's screaming, when he's like, hey, hey, God, please get out of, yeah, when he's screaming, you're like, I like this dude. I remember Mark and I were just sitting on a hotel balcony and they brought Renata Vaca in. And like, I think we looked at each other like 45 seconds in and we're like, absolutely. Yeah, I heard. And it wasn't, I mean, she's an attractive girl, but it wasn't that, she just had this energy. Like, yeah. we were like, wow, this girl's a star. Well, the interesting thing about the Gabriella character is she was written a bit differently in the original script. Uh, but what I saw in her is the potential to be somebody that Amanda could connect to. And so I really wanted Josh and Pete, the writers, to, um, to build on that and to, to make her the least guilty of all of them and the most, the most manipulated by Cecilia and the most, the most vulnerable, vulnerable so that Amanda would see that there is this nuance to her character that, that to me is the, is the toehold of Amanda's doubt in what John Kramer's doing. I meant no harm. I would really like to believe you. I, I really think that um, Gabriella's character is the, I mean, she was acting in a way, but I think that she was being honest with what she was doing with John, like, you know, with all these gestures, with the tequila, for example, or when, when she was talking to him, like, she wasn't acting that much. She was, she was being true in a way with him. I mean, all of them were amazing. When the right actor walks in and says the words, you just know it. Because you can see a hundred actors or actresses say the same thing, no, no, and then all of a sudden one person just, and, and Orn and myself separately both look, said the same thing for each one. So the one thing we kind of do is he'll cast his first choices, I'll cast mine, and it was unanimous, everybody in this movie who we wanted. The story demands that it not be in the United States. And we never really said where any of the Saw movies were, but clearly it was US or Canada, people are speaking English, it's a city. So this had to be outside of the country. And originally we were thinking of going to Eastern Europe. This was probably uh, March 2018, uh, so more than five years ago. Um, and we had a really interesting call with Mark and Oren. And Mark and Oren, for the first time, were saying, um, you know what, 
we might not shoot this in Toronto. Every other Saw film from Saw 2 to Saw 9 Spiral has been uh, shot in Toronto. They've never said where it is, but that's where it always is. The script for Saw X was originally written to take place in Prague, with the idea being that we would shoot in Bulgaria. We were talking about Bulgaria, we were talking about many, many different locations. To be honest, we were thinking possibly going to Norway, because that's where the, 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 the doctor was going to be. There was a lot of discussion about shooting this in Norway. Um, and then when they found a great location in Mexico, all of that changed. And then it became Mexico City. and. The city opened itself up to us. Orin and myself both loved working there. We loved the people there. We had a great experience. And uh, it, it made sense. And as soon as I heard that, I said, money aside, I think that would be the very best place we could possibly shoot and set this story because there's it's so unexpected and there's so much sort of strange history to Mexico City with uh, the Aztecs and Cortez and, and all that. And, and just the fact that it is such a, such a crazy place. Um, I really thought not only do we shoot there, but we set it there. Take a look at that. That's the Metropolitan Cathedral. And that's to the Revolutional Memorial. That's the Angel of Independence. Mexico is replete with spirituality and imagery and uh, um, you go back to the life of the Aztecs. That's where the priests chop the hearts out of their subjects and roll them down the stairs. There's no shortage of uh, strong imagery in Mexico and we have uh, the right crew to create this film. I think the main focus for all of us was to be genuine, you know, and to be realistic. And I think that's what we wanted to do. So when you go and shoot in Mexico City, you want to take everything that's in Mexico City and use it for yourself because it's like an ingredient, right? You're trying to make this best film with all of these, you know, these warm colors and this culture. And we integrated that not only in the movie, but also, you know, in the traps as well. Cecilia's house was a really exciting and interesting location to shoot. It was one of the first locations I got to scout and see, and I got to see it at all times of day because I was like, hey, we're shooting this at night. Really, please don't take me here during the day. I want to see what we're dealing with. We love the idea that she clicks one light, clicks the other light, you know, and where are they? And I think for the audiences, this is great in horror, right? The, the aspect of I can see what's going on, but the character doesn't know what's going on. We looked at the house and sort of what the architecture gave us. And then in the process of taking all these photos, you start to say, well, this angle looks great for this, this angle looks great for this, this angle looks great for this. And this house was glass, and you can see her in it, but you also see pig head up in the roof. And then when that moment happens, you're sort of at that moment where you're like leaning in on the edge of your seat, because you're like, Am I seeing what I think I'm seeing? A person on the top, the roof? Like, what? And you see that and then <laughs> boom, crash, and then things, you know, change. Saw 6, the first one that I directed, was the last one to be shot on 35 millimeter film. And I'm really glad that it was, even though it's it's hard to shoot on film. It's, it's a lot more stressful than digital, but uh, it, th there is great value in the texture that you get uh, from, from film. And once we did Saw 3D, which was shot at, uh, at 2K res on a digital camera, it, we, we started to lose something. There is a theatricality to Saw. There is a theatricality to John Kramer as a character. He's somebody who's orchestrating these massive stages on which he you know, creates his moral questions and quandaries for these characters. We wanted to play with those sort of ideas. We wanted to bring this pervasive darkness. We wanted to bring this theatricality and this sort of giallo kind of inspired photography to the film. We wanted to take the movie back to what some of the earlier films felt and looked like. Oh, we didn't have a choice, we had to. Because so, it was shot, we, it needed to look like the early Saw movie. You know, they were shot on 35. They were scuzzy and gritty. They're, you know, there's our cynical greens and ochre yellows and crimson reds and this sort of like fluorescent blues. You know, we wanted to lean into those palettes. And I think it started from a conversation about what we loved about that. And then also, you know, what could we take from that? And then how do we sort of bend that to our own uses? Even though we shot yeah. on, on 
digital, we lit it in a way that we thought emulated the look of the earlier films, and, and also we dirtied it up a bit in post-production. And then as we started talking, we start to settle on what those things are and what those things feel like. And for us, one of those conversations was, we didn't want this film to be a cyan film. There's so many like modern movies that play with blue and they play with blue in a really magical storybook kind of cyan color. There's another kind of um, side effect uh, of a filter that we used called a pearlescent that does some kind of vintagey things with, uh, with skin, but also causes light sources that are in the frame to kind of halo out. It's pervasive throughout this entire film, but I think it's pretty neat. And that is kind of a look that we saw in, in some of the earlier Saw films, especially ones that were, were, were very heavily into flashbacks, where we would, we would blow out the highlights and blur them and, and do that sort of thing. We know we're going to shoot the dramatic portion a certain way. We had already said we want to go 185. You know, this is set between Saw 1 and 2. It needs to have that aspect ratio. Kevin likes the way that close-ups look in 185 better. I've shot a lot of material in 185, and I feel like there's some, you know, this is a film with a lot of vertical, there's vertical traps. The blood boarding is, you know, blood spilling from above. Gabriella being hoisted into the air. There's a vertical aspect to, they're up in this control room and these characters are down on the floor. You're shooting monitors. Those are boxy. They're not cinemascope. So you're asking questions about that in this, you know, the process of the aspect ratio. And so for us, you know, that was the choice. There's a flourish to the movie. You know, there is a stylistic edge to the movie. We wanted to bring back like the circular dolly track. We wanted to bring back under cranking. We wanted to, you know, as things happen in the trap, we wanted the camera to put a stamp on that, you know? So it's like the finger break, we use a lambda head and we, the camera's flipping as the finger breaks. Finger! And he brought in a whole different sense of drama with a lot of his lighting and that, you know, we can do such a great job with the traps, but if they're not photographed properly, like, it just goes to the wayside. That early look of Saw was, I think, very important, and I think it was part of the mystique of the Saw movies, and Kevin understands that. How do you keep the audience visually intrigued? How do you keep them stimulated? How do you keep them guessing? John, it, it was you? Why? Why are we here? And also do it in a way that is authentic to John Kramer and authentic to Saw. And so I love the first few films, but for me, they kind of live in one tonal palette. You know, they're very, there's a monochromaticness to those movies. They're set in one location and a lot of the lighting lives in that kind of tonal space. I wanted each of our traps to have a unique feel but still feel like they were a part of this world. So for me, what the, the intention was, how would John Kramer approach this? There's a theatricality to John, you know, that we've talked about. And I think for me, the idea that I sort of arrived at, and it's in other Saw movies as well, it's not fully original, but it's, I wanted it to feel like as traps go on, lights change, you know? There's circuits that are connected to these traps. And when that circuit flips, when they press the button, the trap turns on, a light connected to the trap or within the trap turns on. You know, that's sort of how things twist into a new direction. In being around Kevin and just talking about what the scenes are about, what the beats of the scenes are, um, what the prosthetics are gonna look like, what, you know, his experience with Ansel in the past has meant. It's all those like range of conversations you have with every person and department that ultimately feed into what the movie becomes. So that I think is, is, is a big part of why this film, in my opinion, at least looks like the earlier Saws. They wanted to make it look like Saw 2. He and Anthony Stabley, our production designer, were integral to the movie. I mean, it would not look and feel like it does without both of them. So the creation of the traps in the Saw franchise is one of the more interesting aspects to the writing process. We're always told right from the beginning, Mark and Warren are always like, don't think about the traps, don't worry about that, let's just come up with the story. But being a writer that cares 
and wants desperately to please and wants desperately to come up with new ideas, we always throw ourselves into those traps, even in the early drafts, even in the outlines. I have the, the brain trap in Saw X is in, I think, our third story meeting. In general, in Saw films, the, uh, the, the traps may or may not be fully fleshed out in the script. I'd say on this one, at least by the time we got a shooting draft, Josh and Pete had done most of the heavy lifting in terms of figuring out what the basic concepts were. However, it, there's a lot of reality to how to pull these things off, and I, I wanted these traps to, to work more mechanically in real life than we've ever done before. I think the traps started getting over the top. And one of the things we, we really looked at is, is bringing the traps down in scale and size to where you could basically, you know, everything you need to make these traps is in Home Depot. We've had to, uh, frankly, use a lot of editing trickery and, and uh, digital uh, visual effects in order to overcome the shortcomings that we had on, on production. So for this one, I'm like, let's, let's really make what we're gonna shoot and make it work on screen. There is a lot going on. There is a lot of technical stuff. There is a lot of props. There are other... The scenes are complicated. It's ensemble scenes. You have the traps. There are so many peculiar things that gotta be right. The process starts with the writer. They outline sort of the requirements of the traps. So we always try. We always work our hardest to come up with a great trap. And then, over the course of time, different voices come in and help those traps. It might be something very, very small, where we had one version of the trap and it gets tweaked by the production manager or the designer or Kevin or Mark or Oren or Lionsgate will come in and, and, and help out with that stuff. And then we go from that, we have discussions with Kevin. We talk about what we like, what we think is realistic, what we think needs to be improved. You know, there's also the clock is ticking, so we ha it has to be realistic that we can accomplish this during that time. And then we start putting together concept arts. So our production designer, Anthony Stabley, who is one of the most enthusiastic people I've ever met in my life, he absolutely was for that, and he sought out a team among the crew members in, uh, in Mexico City that, that could really pull it off. I had, uh, you know, two really great concept artists that were working with us, and we also had a team that we put together for the traps to construct the traps. And then after you sort of rough it in, then you have to start putting together tests. I think this movie had more interdepartmental conversations than any other project I'd worked on. Once you get into a trap, you're dealing with special effects, prosthetics, VFX, production design, lighting ultimately and cinematography and all of those elements have to you know come together costumes as well like there's so many different elements and all of that's designed to capture this performance that's in front of you as well as i mean we had a lot of stunts in all of these traps as well <laughs> We have to be concerned about safety. We have to make sure that it's believable. And I would say with all of the traps, we averaged about five to six different tests. Okay, Kevin, another idea is if we don't have the bomb connected to something that we could have it to him, and then he runs, he moves, and then action. And then that starts thing. And then when he looks at his arm, then it starts doing its thing. And then so the thing here is, the challenge is that you're not just trying to get the traps ready for shooting. You have to get ready way earlier so that we can start with these tests. No matter what, we always succeed because we're gonna hear, you know, we're gonna learn something from the test. And that really came down to Kevin's vision on how he wanted to approach these traps. And he, and he has so much history with the franchise that he really knew what he wanted. He knew how he wanted to approach it. He's very open to suggestion, of course. And the great thing is he had already started on storyboards for, for much of it. So by the time I got into it, the, I would say at least a third of it had already been 
through the process of storyboarding. So I was able to look at it, have intelligent conversations on how we approach it, camera angles, how do we hide these rigs, do we need to build facades, you know, all the complexities that can be involved with some of these. At least those storyboards were there and kind of helped us both visualize on how to approach this. I used a, a storyboard artist, Evan Yarborough, to, to kind of flesh out the visuals of those ideas. The uh, production designer then takes them to the team, the people that make all the, all the mechanics of it all. Then we go to the stunt team and, and they try to figure out how we can pull it all off. That's not to say that everything worked perfectly because it didn't and as is often the case, there are a lot of wires and uh, people hidden in things that are operating things. They kind of knew where they were going. So they sent us everything that they had built or you know even components that were in process. So we could take a look at it. We could put it in the proper scenario with the effect or at least a proxy of the effect and try and figure out how do we make this work? And then we would send back suggestions of like, hey, I think we need to adjust the cables on this. We need better tension here or maybe you don't have any control over the cables, we control it, or the rig itself that we're building controls it. So we had this dance back and forth between several different departments to kind of figure out how this would all work. The bloodboarding trap in particular, there, there must be 20 different people operating different spigots, operating the seesaw, operating the gears, operating the lights, the dissension of the tanks, everything. There's like a different guy and, you know, we're shouting directions and Spanish and English back and forth to, to coordinate everything. It's very, very hard, right? So uh, the way we were able to make it work is by testing a lot. But then we had a lot of challenges, you know, like we have so much blood. So how are we gonna deal with all this blood? So I would say almost all the traps were coated with resin, you know, because we needed to clean the traps during the shoot. We even, on some of our sets, the flooring, we put in, you know, uh, vinyl and linoleums and we did we built faux finish flooring so i think the key for all of us was can we make this trap can it work can we clean it up in time one of the most complicated parts of this production and one that we almost died on was prosthetics we really had trouble at first and the 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 production stumbled a bit because uh, it turns out that we needed some of these actors six weeks in advance in order for them to be cast and then for the parts to be prepared and then for us to be able to rehearse with the parts before we actually shot. So for that reason, we hired Justin Raleigh and the team over at Fractured. They began their work. We shot the first three weeks of the film doing nothing with prosthetics because we simply didn't have them. Then we took about five weeks of time off um, over the holidays for them to, to finish their work and then we came back in January. <laughs> These traps are like magic tricks, you know, because we have to hide limbs. We have to find a place for the real arm. We have to put the fake arm. We have to work with prosthetics. And honestly, that worked very quickly. Like we were able to figure out what that dance was gonna look like, who was handling what in a very, very short period of time. And then it just came down to rehearsals once we got to Mexico City, you know, actually getting it in the real space with the actual finished components of the set and making sure that it all worked ahead of filming. And, and we did that on every single gag. We were absolutely blessed by the incredible craftsmanship of our prosthetics department. We definitely spoke to Nick and, you know, went through all that process of like, this is gonna be the lighting here, this is, you know, gonna be more red, more blue, whatever, and it always affects the blood. This was very rare that we got so many tests, so many, I guess you could call them dress rehearsals, and they lit it the way that they were going to light it. Nick was there showing us the frames, and so we were able to adjust the color. Like, we ran through the rehearsal, adjust the blood, I'll go out, okay, it's still lit, I'll go just double check it, all the stuff that kind of feeds into the prep work. You, it's like you would look at the actor's leg and then you would look at the prosthetic and you're like, I can't tell the difference. Valentina is probably the most complicated gag, um, just because it had to do so many things on camera and budgetarily, you know, we can't build you know, six of those things. So we really had to kind of make it a one trick pony in a lot of ways. Even in my 20 plus year career, that's one of the hardest gags that I've personally done because there are so many elements that they wanted to get out of one like fake body. So not only is the leg getting sawed off, the head's coming off and all of this. And then you got to think we have to hide tubing. We have to do all of this multiple, multiple stuff. 
all in within one fake body. In the case of how we pulled it off, of course, you're mostly seeing her real legs in the, in the long scene that precedes the trap itself. I don't know what is in the head of Kevin. Like, <laughs> why? He has an amazing Im imagination. And I don't know, there is a very specific trams that it's so fun to be there. Like, yeah. And then even when she starts to cut, we built a, a protection device on the underside of her leg that, uh, that saved her from cutting herself when she's doing this with the gilly saw. Oh. But once it gets into the action, there's two major components to it. There's a full fake body, full complete likeness of her, of the actress. And then there's a separate, and we made multiples of these for that initial sawing through the leg gag. We see, you know, blood coming up, practical blood through this blade. And then we had to have her step out replace the pedestal that she's sitting on with one that has a hole in it so that her real leg can be hidden in the hole and then a fake leg attached that uh, then we resume shooting with her really cutting through that entire leg and then using the, the femur that Fractured Effects built into it um, as the source of the marrow. So it was uh, fairly complex to pull all that off. You know, we shot that entire scene in, God, how many days was it? I think it carried over, so it was probably about three days. So we get to one point and then the day's done, then we start the next day and the leg's already cut off and now we've got to go back and do, you know, the stump. The, the prosthetic itself was, was the entire body and head of Paulette and there's a, there's a mechanism for holding the head up in that pipe that she's attached to and uh, so many different moving pieces that had to work. So she not only had to cut a leg off, and then m make sure that worked. Yes! No! Do it, man! No! Okay, well now, bring in the full body of her, and it had to be articulated, it had to be able to fall a certain way, and even that's unpredictable. It's like, all right, add another piece of monofilament so I can drag the body this way. All right, it wants to do this one time, but it's not always gonna do it the same the next time. Doing it in a way that when she does get decapitated. Her torso falls towards Cecilia in a way that it's believable that Cecilia would be able to grab her torso and pull it over and cut the intestines out so that all that nonsense can, uh, can transpire later in the story. But then that had to fall down on the ground and now they have to cut her open. So then on the day we had to let the body, they shot how they wanted it, now we pull it over and we had to cut open the body and we had to get in there during lunch break and fabricate, anatomically correct, the inside, the intestines, load it with blood, and we're building a new gag uh, right there. Okay, we got half an hour, let's get this done. Thank goodness for blood. <laughs> that shot of her head falling off and her body collapsing, we were focused on Cecilia's face in the foreground because she's turned away and can't bear to watch. That, that There's no digital work in that shot at all. I was I was very proud of it. I shot that that so that if the MPA gave us an NC-17 for the shots where you really actually see her head get cut off, we would at least have that. As it turns out, we we're able to use all the shots that we did. I don't know what the MPA was thinking, but I'll take it. My trap, I was terrified from 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 the moment I read it the first time from 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 the time I met Kevin, our director, and we were kind of running through it during the audition process. <laughs> that was madness. <laughs> Surprisingly, that scene was easier to shoot than most of the trap sequences, and I, I, I owe a lot of that to fractured effects because um, the original idea was that we'd have the real Mateo with the real shaved head doing this with the with a fake saw so that at least it looks like he's going through the motions. Then we would have a fake head where we see actual cutting happen and then we would go back to the real actor for pulling the brains out. Initially, Kevin wanted to completely shave his head. 
and that would have required a bald cap or having the actor actually shave his head. And I, I just kept thinking like, that's a lot of prep. There's a lot that, you know, Jigsaw would have to do to get to that point. And what does that look like? And I had concerns about continuity and, you know, there was concerns of him wearing a wig once he shaved his head, if they had to go backwards. So I, I made this push, you know, looking at the rig, it's like, why don't we build a little facade? That entire effect was all practical. You know, we had a, a prosthetic that went on the actor. We had a dummy head that was for the macro shots. And, um, you know, it was a good example of like an on-screen effect of cutting, opening up the brain, seeing everything moving and working all simultaneously. <laughs> what I didn't anticipate between the video camera that's above him and the live feed that Matteo is looking at that allows him to guide himself through what he's doing is, is, is how much we could actually get away with this fake head sitting in the wheelchair with the one camera pointing straight down and the other one kind of at a lateral direction and the the video camera we we're able to just have octavio the mateo actor standing next to his fake self with his hand in here <laughs> 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 But I was panning back and forth between the TV and Mateo's hand and the, the fake head and going, this, this actually looks better than I ever imagined it, it could be. You know, we move from that and then we move into Gabriella, which it's, then I'm playing the background actually a lot darker than we had played it anywhere else, so that the red just feels like intense and Basically, we're pushing the cameras right to the edge of overexposure. The idea is that the only way she can escape this thing is to smash her way out of her shackles. Uh, so, you know, that all sounds easy enough on paper, but uh, it turned out, I think, to be the most complicated trap and the one that um, required the most testing all the way up to the day before we shot it. to go through, like I literally, it was me the, I mean, of course I have a, 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 a sound girl that was helping me with, with the hard parts, but it was me, the, the one that was flying on air. And uh, we had a lot of challenges with her and the stunt department and getting her up there and the rig and making it feel believable. It works with a lot of pulleys and ropes. We had six different ropes, sometimes seven at the same time and two people for each rope. So my job on that trap was to make sure that everybody knew what they're gonna do, when they're gonna do it, and how they're gonna do it. The, the um, RNAs, it's just so uncomfortable and it hurts a lot. She could only hang for a certain amount of time. Putting her up there, getting some shots, taking her down, going through the, the burn makeup levels that we intended to, to, to do. Those took at least an hour each, during which I switched to the camera that's facing the back of her and had her stunt double up there. So usually when you're seeing her from behind, it's her, it's her stunt double. But frankly, even with all that testing, it was a lot harder than I thought. It's hard to go through it, you know, like emotionally it's just too hard. The the, the first day that, that, that I was starting to film my trap, I was just on, on the makeup track and I was kind of thinking about that and about death and about like the loneliness and sadness of my character and I was and I was just like starting to cry because I it's it's just it's just very sad and I and I just try to try to do it uh, with all the respect and with all the love I could do it. And but yeah it's it's definitely hard. <laughs> It was, it was complicated and that, even though every day on every movie feels like, oh man, are we even gonna make our day? That was the one where I thought, this is, this is where we crash and burn. I, I just don't see that we're ever gonna be able to finish this scene today. And yet we somehow did. This was very special because all of these movies revolve around the traps and the makeup and the practical and everyone, they kind of know what comes along with that. 
So it was good to be able, and it's very rare now to have prep days and test days. So at least also going into this, we knew what could happen and we were already prepared to fix what could go wrong. Obviously our technology has improved over the years as well. Our level of realism has drastically improved as camera technology and everything else we've had to evolve. So being part of, of, of this Saw film and the history of Saw, I feel like it was very important for us to, to give it our all. My job is to bring humanity to John Kramer. The traps I leave to the people who are disturbed enough to come to come up with some of these things. Kevin Greuter edited the first five, directed six, directed seven. So for us, having Kevin Greuter, I mean, he's in, you know, he has such an amazing memory and take on everything. There's been, what, five different writers over the course of the franchise. Mark and Oren, yes, they are experts on it, and they're the, they're, they're the, the, the ones in charge. But Kevin has sat there and scrolled frame by frame of every single moment of every single Saw film. And when you're editing, it just it, it invades your mind. You have dreams about it. So he's been dreaming about the Saw franchise since a year before we saw the first film in the movie theater. That's how long Kevin has been involved in this franchise. It's really fun to work with him on this. They couldn't have hired a better director because imagine like everything this man has to hold in his head all day long, like 18 years of details and you're going back to this particular time, so you have to hold all those details. Uh, he's edited most of the Saw films, directed a few of them, so nobody knows Saw the way, the way Kevin knows Saw. From both shooting my own films and editing other people's films, I've, uh, I've kind of refined in my head at least what I think I need to pull scenes off. Be a lot of over and tight here, and we'll feel it's fake, but just try to avoid all that. And it involves shooting a lot of material. There's, there's no doubt about it, and um, it's not always a luxury to, to shoot everything that you want, but I do feel I've gotten pretty good at shooting enough. And I realized that he was the one to kind of go back to the original John Kramer story. Kevin is a brilliant mind. Yes, he's an editor. Yes, he knows how to edit a scene together. So he's seeing it in his mind beforehand. But he's also really smart. He's smart about tone. He's smart about um, about tempo. So it's, it, it, it is the way I think, uh, as an editor, that is, when I'm directing a scene, uh, I think I drove the actress a bit crazy on this one, especially in scene 89, that giant scene where people wake up in the trap and John comes in and does his monologue about why this is happening to them. And then that scene flows into the Valentina scene. There was a lot of coverage shot on that scene. And Tobin took me aside and was like, do you really need all this? And I said, I really do. <laughs> and I can say, you know, that I used everything. I used some of everything that I shot. This is not right. The lecture in moral decency. He's very detail oriented. He's very shot oriented, very edit oriented. He knows what the shot he needs and wants because he knows how to make this film cut together so it has impact. All of you. You promised dying people. Dying people! You could save their lives. And I think the reason that scene and hopefully the movie as a whole feels so rich is because I didn't just cover the scenes. I, I shot them in a way that I thought would be visually compelling and and where I would have lots of options in the editing room for, for making things work where there were pacing issues or where I wanted to pump up emotions higher. Kevin sees this franchise as a whole in a way that no one else does. And I think that it really allowed him to bring something special to this film.
generally when I get to the end of the first pass of, of my movies, I feel this white hot panic because the movie's too short. The white hot panic this time was because the first cut of the movie was two hours and 42 minutes long, something I've never experienced. He got it down to 2.35 or something before he showed it to us, and then we all worked together to get it down to right around two hours. It's a sickening feeling because neither I nor anybody else wants a Saw movie that's over two hours long, and in fact, usually we're closer to 90 minutes instead of 120. You know, being a screenwriter is sometimes tough because you're making the initial decisions, um, your hands are on the keyboard for every word, but once you write the end um, and it starts turning into buff pages and salmon pages and salmon two and buff five, it starts to get away from you. There were a lot of scenes that I had to cut. There were a lot of moments that I really liked that I had to cut, but I made those decisions before I even showed the movie for the most part to anybody and feel like what was sacrificed in the editing room, we, we, we earned it and what remains on the scene is, is earned as well. But you need it all. I mean, and the movie flies Because it's a story. By. It's not just Tobin and what Trat, it's a real story. It's, it's almost two movies. Right, it's almost two stories. So part A is John Kramer is going to go somewhere and have his brain tumor cured, right? And so that is more of a dramatic story. And so you take it through that whole section of the movie and that's the first big chunk of the movie, but you have to tell that story for the second part of the movie to work, which is where you get into being a saw movie. Buenas noches. ¿A dónde vamos? Al infierno. This movie, Saw X, is really quite different from the previous nine because so much of it takes place not in some underground evil lair or some trap. And the whole first sort of third of the movie is not only does it take place in daylight and outdoors, but it also is a, is a sort of sympathetic and uh, hopeful kind of tale about uh, John Kramer's eventual treatment for this disease that's gonna kill him. Jigsaw didn't start out this movie as Jigsaw. He started as John Kramer, a man who's sick, and he's trying to figure out a way to extend his life, his life expectancy. As John Kramer, not as Jigsaw, not as boom, 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 but John Kramer as a, as a person. That's how the movie opened. Well, I've worked with Charlie Clauser really on all the, the films. Foremost in the selection of the temp music that I cut into the film while I'm putting it together. So uh, not that he or any composer necessarily needs to emulate it or, or try to match it, but it, it's at least a, a, a guidepost. It's fantastic having him both directing and editing on Saw X because then he can create the raw material that he knows he's gonna to need to create that, that sort of pacing. So we, uh, we began the process by just sitting and watching the movie together. There were places where, you know, he and I both acknowledged that I'd gone maybe farther than I necessarily wanted to in terms of finding sort of traditional emotional music to, to, to signify what John's going through in the non-saw parts of the film. So there's these hopeful and sort of bright and sunny moments in that first third of the film that are quite different from anything we've done in, in the, the previous movies. And of course that requires a completely different approach from the scoring end of things. And so I knew that it would sonically need to relate to the Saw movies. I wasn't gonna all of a sudden use a woodwinds quartet and that sort of thing, but it need, musically and melodically, it, it wanted to have a kind of ray of sunshine uh, aspect to it. One thing that's become a trademark of many of the pieces of music in Saw movies is this relentless downward motion to the chords and to the, the root note that we're hearing in the low end and everything's always moving down on the keyboard or the instruments so that it feels like we're being dragged down into some horrible place with the characters as they as we follow their 
inevitable decline. But in Saw X, there needed to be kind of the opposite of that. And while I wasn't going to necessarily use like these rising, uh, epic, glorious chord progressions, I needed to have a very light touch in a few of the scenes. And I was using some sounds and some instruments that I don't typically use in a, in a Saw movie. Um, I have a piece of music up here, which has these gentle distant piano notes and a sort of mournful cello melody and still the kind of dark and ambient textures that I would use in a Saw movie, something that you would expect, but a little bit of a more hopeful emotion behind the music. So I can show you that. Um, and I'll kind of start this piece of music sort of in the middle just before the cellos and stuff come in. Um, and it sounds like this. And that's pretty atypical for a Saw movie. But there's still some darkness. And so I guess that's a good example of uh, a piece of music that's a, at first feels like it's out of character for a, a Saw film, but the actual ingredients behind that little harp thing that's playing a sort of pattern and the notes that are contained within that sort of mournful cello melody, the actual ingredients within that are very much uh, of a piece with the other musical material in the in the rest of the score and technically i'm extracting some of the notes and intervals and melodies even from the hello zep theme and from the baptism theme and from some of the more familiar themes that have been used in spots throughout the franchise so this is a, an effort to sort of recontextualize i guess some of those original musical ingredients and, but still keeping it of a piece and, and feeling like it's familiar territory uh, sonically while kind of going in a slightly different direction musically. It was, a, it was a process. It definitely was a process. He's, of course, worked on lots of films besides Saw, but he does tend to be known for um, a kind of industrial uh, sound, and he works almost entirely from synthesizers and uh, sample libraries and that sort of thing. His... Editing style is very rhythmic, um, so for the trap scenes, which always have uh, the the music that I create is always sort of the, following a very rhythmic and in, incessant and relentless kind of drive to the final timer running out and the thing slamming down. Um, so that's very helpful because he knows that uh, he needs to edit things with a certain pace and rhythm that gets faster and faster and faster. And that's natural for what he, what his skills are and talents as an editor. You know, in a lot of the uh, trap type scenes in Saw X, uh, most of them are actually more kind of bonkers and extreme than in some of the earlier movies. And I was able to use some sounds that were just 
completely unhinged sort of scraping and and torturing of stringed instruments. And I, I had a couple of unusual instruments that I've added to my collection recently uh, and was able to use them to create uh, musical sounds that are reminiscent of what's happening on the screen when a certain person is removing a certain body part uh, by means of a a wire saw, and so I, I always like it if there are some elements in the score that sound uh, almost as if they're a sound effect that goes with what's happening on screen. And so as uh, um, a certain person is sawing away at a certain body part, I was able to create these sounds using a, uh, a guitar viol, which is a sort of uh, a cross between a cello and a guitar. And so I kind of loosened the strings as far as they would go and scraped away at the thing with a violin bow. And I had these little sounds as a result, which sort of sound like a saw. And then I used this other instrument uh, called the apprehension engine, which is uh, a strange custom hybrid acoustic instrument that has a hurdy-gurdy element, which is, you know, like the old uh, organ grinder with a monkey on a leash kind of thing, where you turn a crank and it has the effect of bowing uh, strings, similar to what you do with a cello or a violin, but crank operated. And so I was able to create these kind of similar sounds in the same family, but that, that have that sawing kind of effect, and they sound like this. And then as the cue progresses and things get a little more intense, that sound gets faster and more insistent and winds up being like this. And they're, you know, they're not sophisticated cello parts. They're just very simple sonic elements. But when you pile all those things together on top of some insane drum sounds and some big slams, the end result is is still sort of an action cue with a relentless pulse and a tempo that's accelerating, but it still kind of has uh, an aspect that sounds like what's happening on the screen. And once it gets going and kicks in, it sounds like this. There's an element of ticking clock to it. Accompanied by these sawing kind of musical effects. things get a little insane. Later on in the piece of music, the sound effect aspect of some of the musical sounds just gets utterly unhinged and there's sort of bursts of chaotic scraping and just r sounds that are barely music, but still work within the context of this sonic landscape that I'm trying to create to go with this horrific scene. those sort of tortured, scraping away at a violin kind of sounds, uh, like. And you know, this is not the type of thing that I can really do in uh, the other kind of projects that I score. Saw movies present a, a, a unique and fertile landscape for using these kind of ugly and tortured sounds that I probably wouldn't get away with in most of the things that I score.
And this is something that's kind of unique in my experience with the Saw franchise. It's not a, the kind of configuration that happens in a lot of the other projects that I do. So whenever I'm uh, faced with the, the climbing that mountain again and doing some elaborately constructed cue for a, for a trap scene, I know that because of Kevin's directing and editing style that it's not going to be a, 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 a painful train crash of rhythms that feel out of sync with the picture and out of sync with the action on screen. So. Uh, even though the job can be hard at times to lay that stuff out, Kevin's natural tendency to, to cut the scenes in a rhythmic manner um, makes, makes it that much easier for me. That game is over, and a new game's about to begin. A month or two ago, I went to Lionsgate uh, to, to see the trailer for the first time. Uh, I was there with Mark and Oren in a room of, I don't know, 10 people. And they, you know, I was very nervous. What's it going to be? Is it going to spoil? Whatever. Uh, and I saw it, and I got kind of teary. And I, I couldn't speak for a few seconds um, because I just couldn't believe that that was a movie that I worked on because I love the trailer so much. And the use of that song in the air that I breathe um, w just really had this emotional impact that I, I couldn't believe. I had so many goosebump moments on this movie. You know, it, from the very beginning, when I have the camera, I am the first audience. You know, I get to be the first person there, and it's one of the reasons I love operating. To have those experiences, to have all these like goosebump moments, and then to get to the point where I finally saw Kevin's cut, the approved studio cut. And I remember when the Zepp's theme kicked on, and the bloodboarding trap is ending, and the, you know, the trap with Parker and Cecilia kicks on, and that theme kicks on, and I was like, holy fucking shit. It's so exciting <laughs> to see fans discover each aspect of Saw X as it's coming out, right? A trailer, um, the poster. Fast forward uh, another month and here we are at midsummer. I'm on a stage, not my favorite place to be in the world, but I knew we had something really good for people to watch. And so they, they turned the lights down on us, thank God, and showed the trailer. Hello, midsummer screen. Toby Bell here. I'm back. I'm pleased to tell you that you're getting the very first look anywhere at the Sora X trail. And the response almost immediately was so overwhelming. I was crying. First of all, being there, the atmosphere was tremendous. But seeing, I've described this to Mark the second we got off the stage and everyone I've talked to. When the trailer ended and Shawnee Smith, the end of the trailer lifts off her mask, the people, look, it felt like someone scored an overtime goal. People were standing and screaming. The choice is yours. To be able to go to this Midsummer Scream experience was so exciting. I remember getting, I, you know, we get there and there's just like standing behind that stage, you know, I got a chance to go see the exhibit and see how many people were lined up and how many people, like I got a chance to work with Billy and these traps and, I, and then to see those things taken and presented at a convention where people are lining up to go see this, take their picture with this, to feel like they're a part of this franchise. It was incredible. So. Uh, I, I've, I've never felt more happy and confident about an art, you know, an artistic undertaking of my own than I did on that stage at Midsummer. With Saw X, we are simultaneously doing something that is a legitimate throwback while also doing something very new that has never happened in a Saw movie before. And those two things are happening simultaneously. That's a very, very hard magic trick. So, you know, our credo all along was that, you know, let's, let's do cool retro Saw stuff that's gonna excite the fans. So I went down on the Wednesday night before we delivered the film. Uh, I drove down to Toronto. I was in Northern Ontario to drive down 
Mark and I always, Mark was there weeks before making sure all the effects and everything were laid in. They did some, a little bit of sound after, so I went in to see before delivery just to have one final look at it. And before we did, Phil Stillman, our post-production supervisor, said, I need to show you something. He brought out a laptop. And he showed the beginning with the current Lionsgate moving logo. And I was like, okay, well, I don't really understand the exercise. Then he showed it with the OG, OG, Lionsgate moving gears genre moving logo. And I was like, oh my God, this is tremendous. This is insane. It wasn't revealed in Saw 1, but on Saw 2, a original logo was created by Lionsgate marketing team and became a big part of all the subsequent movies and hasn't been used uh, in over 10 years. Phil said, well, we have a real problem. This was Wednesday night, late Wednesday night, and he said, we have to completely open the movie up, sync sound, everything is different to get this logo in. And it's, we're supposed to deliver on Friday. It was Saturday, Sunday, Monday's a holiday. So anyway, long story short, um, I, I said, I think we should do it. He said, well, I haven't gotten complete confirmation we're allowed to do this. So they were battling around. Mark and I the next morning get a call from Helen Lee Kim, who runs all of Foreign for Lionsgate, yelling at us and yelling at us that it was our idea to switch logos. So Mark is kind of going, yep, yep, well, we think it's really important. And Mark took the lead in this and said, it's important, we believe in it. So uh, we knew it was gonna be a little bit complicated because the film was done and delivered, but we had the will and we did it. Truthfully, there was a young man named Cooper Stevenson, who's a 14-year-old fan. There's a young man who is a huge fan of Saw movies and brought it up uh, to some uh, execs at Lionsgate saying, wouldn't it be great if you had the throwback logo? But no one wanted to put their name on it because we were opening up a finished movie. So they blamed Mark and I for this incredible idea. And after we figured out why they blamed us because it was a huge kerfuffle. And it delayed the international delivery yep, by yep. a day and the international was really upset. I I think it's going to be a fantastic surprise for the, the true Saw fans when they go into the theater and it's like, oh man, I haven't seen that in 15 years. So I was really happy with that idea. But it was the right thing to do for the movie. And all I can say is thank you, Cooper, because uh, <laughs> it, it, it opens the movie with the right tone. And none of us thought about it. And to me, that is such a great idea that it comes from this next generation's fans of Saw. Well, you know, we made the first Saw film uh, almost 20 years ago. There is an entirely new generation of young people coming into this film. It's crazy, but it's it's a powerful, the, the story's compelling and the fans are just like, the Saw fans, next level. These people are not here because they're casual fans. These are people that are here because they love horror, they love Saw, and they're extremely invested in what this movie and this franchise is going to do. I love the fans of the Saw franchise. I adore hopping onto Reddit. I don't care if they're just telling, Josh Stolberg is the worst writer of all time. Pete Goldfinger couldn't write his way out of a paper bag. Whatever it is, they've ruined the franchise. I love it because I am the fan also on those websites in order to to, to learn and engage and meet these crazy freaking people. The Saw fans are like none other. Almost as big a mystery as, as John Kramer's character himself is, is what the fans really see in this story, that they can be so enthusiastic about it after 20 years. And, you know, like I've mentioned in the past, I, uh, I try to do more of what I like the most and less of what I don't like so much and I try not to question too much but just go with my gut in terms of, uh, of making, making a film for, for me really, even though really it's for this, this broader audience. Frankly, I think we're just in tune, the, the Saw fans and, and I, so uh, uh, if, they, if they like it half as much as I do, then we're gonna win. There's not a, a week that goes by that somebody doesn't come up and, and start telling me about the first time they saw Saw, you know, and what it meant to them and how they look forward to it. And we're just kind of going, as long as the movies work, we'll keep making them.
double, a double.
Let's say that here is the bomb. Okay, the first step. Corriendo. And action. And is that marrow also coming out? Not yet. Not yet. I need to see that little thicker and we need gunk, gunk in it that lands. Because yeah. some of it needs to stay on here to make the scale go down. Yeah. Then we'll fine tune the landing point. I'm gonna do it with this hand, right? Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. 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 Maybe move that apple box, please, uh, and 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 then move, step around. The, uh, do you want to move the? Table I, I think up? I think this will be all right.
acá todo el tiempo, ¿eh? Todo el tiempo. Ahí te estás quemando. Okay. All right, cut, good. That was pretty great. Para el lado de John. Para el lado de Carlos.
I came to talk to you, Will, because uh, I've found a treatment for my cancer that I think holds a lot of promise. Well, um, the buck stops here, John. Fire away. This is a doctor in Norway. She injects what she calls suicide genes. There's an article about it. Into cancerous tumor cells. Then an inactive form of a toxic drug is administered and it kills off all the cancer cells that has these suicide genes in it. Yeah, well, I'm familiar with the treatment you're talking about. All right. And a new trial starting. OK, I'm going to be straight with you. At your age and with the development of your cancer, it's simply not feasible for umbrella health. Wait, 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 wait. What's not feasible? By whose mathematical equation is this not feasible? It's policy, John. It's policy. And if you go outside the system and seek out this treatment, you will be in breach of policy, and you will be dropped from coverage completely. I'm sorry. to meet the team. Just so you know, I wired the first half of the payment yesterday. Thank you. Internet goes in and out here, but I'm sure the office has received it. So you really think you can help me cheat death, huh? I know we can. Our success rate has only improved since I shut my father down. Try to relax. This is why you came to Mexico. So, your immune system's role is to what? Eliminate uh, harmful foreign bodies from my system. That's right. It's the T cell's job to fight cancer tumors, but cancer cells are tricky. And fool those T cells into thinking they're good guys. But you know all this. We're injecting CPG oligonucleotide into your bloodstream, along with several different antibodies that bind to the receptors. These will basically kick your T cells in the arse and remind them how to clean house. Are you all right? Yeah. We're also injecting minute amounts of my father's cocktail, the NK cell counteractants. These will start to simulate your body's immune response to directly attack the malignant tumors. After surgery, you will get full doses of this. And we're done. You did great today, John. Thank you, Gabrielle. I cannot eat this morning I, because of the anesthesia. Pero se tiene que mantener fuerte. I know. Not today. You see? It's time, John. Suerte. You're not bothered by the sight of blood? I've seen my share. You've seen war? 
of sorts. And who performs the surgery? Dr. Ramon Cortez, also at Alta Prado. He's the best neurosurgeon in 2,000 miles. He's the doctor I'd use if my own family was on the table. And he's also worked with my father. Now, we'll be performing an awake craniotomy. This means that you'll be floating in and out of consciousness so that we can do function mapping. This allows us to monitor your ability so that we don't touch any part of your brain that might affect speech or movement. Excuse me, you speak English? Yes. I need to see Dr. Ramon Cortez. He's on the surgical staff here. There's no Dr. Cortez here? An anesthesiologist named Mateo. You sure you have the right hospital? That, my friend, is the old elastic statue of Clara. Every day, a tourist wants me to take them here. John. You call me John. Well, what do I call you? Is it Diego? Where should I call you? Doctor <coughs> Cortez. <laughs> I need your help locating your friends, your accomplices. Yes, 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 sir, I'll tell you everything. I'll tell you everything you want to know. I never doubted that you would, Diego. Okay. And after that, well, I'd like to play a game. What are you doing? Hey, what happened? That game is over. 
and a new game's about to begin. <laughs> Valentina, did my blood ever make it to the lab, or did you just suck it out and flush it down the drain somewhere? <laughs> The key to your freedom is inside that box. What the hell is that? It's a Geely saw. I thought you said there was a key. He was speaking metaphorically. He does that a lot. When I get out of here, I'm gonna kill both of you motherfucker! That's a good plan. You're gonna wanna really listen carefully to the rules in order to pull that off. Fuck you! <laughs> you know, while crude, your English is quite good, Valentina. But I suppose it needs to be for the con to work, right? Mr. Graber, Mr. Graber, please listen to me, I beg you. I beg you, please, please. We have nothing to do with this. We didn't know what was going on. It was all her. She planned the whole thing. She was the one that did everything we didn't know. Hotel. I don't even know if that's your real name. It is my real name. It is. Oh. Because they've never heard of you at the hospital. She told me to say that I was there, but I, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You know, I recall you congratulating me in the kindest way after my treatment. I, I didn't even get a payment. Mm. I, didn't even get... I hope I get to return the favor. Mr. Graber, you don't get it. I meant no harm. I would really like to believe you, Gabriella. You'll have a chance to prove yourself. Por favor. When I was a kid, my uncle used to take me fishing. Each lure attracted a different kind of fish. You went fishing too, didn't you, Cecilia? Fishing with a PH. That's the same concept. You trick your prey, you target the weak. What was the lure that you used to hook me? with my life, my life. I desire to live another day. John, please, I can make this right. You'll get that opportunity. saw inside that box was invented by an Italian physician, Leonardo Gili. It was essential in conducting amputations in the early 1900s. It creates an extraordinarily clean cut to the bone. line on your leg marks the spot. Are you fucking crazy? What makes you think I fucking cut off my own leg? Because if you don't, the wire saw that's wrapped around your neck will first cut into your skin, then your vertebral ligaments, your muscles, your pharynx, your vertebrae, and finally it'll sever your spinal cord. 
the Cliff Notes version. It's gonna cut your head off. You won't. You wouldn't. Uh, that's true. We won't. But Valentina might. <laughs> You killed Diego. No, your friend is very much alive. He played his game and he won, as each of you can. <laughs> and he's a better man for it. And he gave up the four of you. How do you think we found you? He's in stable condition and expected to survive. So of course there probably will be some scars. <laughs> you can't. <laughs> All of you. All of you. All of you. You promised dying people. Dying people! That you could save their lives. And in doing so, you took advantage of the only thing that they still possessed. Hope? No, John. We've worked to heal people. Your case was different. And still you lie. You know, for, for 40 years, I worked as an engineer and an architect. I sat at a simple drafting table with a wooden pencil. My associate Amanda here has dragged me into the digital age. She's a talented programmer and a gifted hacker. She's had a look at your bank records. Take a look. Who were those 34 people to you? John's case was different. Did you heal any of those 34 people? Did they have spouses? Did they have children that are now orphaned? Do they have grandchildren? You've been doing this larcenous dance now for more than eight years. Eight years. That's more than $8 million. That's a lot of pain to inflict on others for your own enrichment. There was no healing going on there, bitch. They're all underground. I checked. Please, please don't do this. Please, please help me, please. That's exactly what we are doing, Valentina. This is not retribution. It's a reawakening. You're sick. You're sick, John. I'm sick. Well, I think you... You well know that. Which is why I didn't see clearly. Why I was blinded. Not only by my desire to live. But by my fear of death. But this isn't about me. It's about you and all the families that you've destroyed. I did not destroy. Save it, lady. We know everything. We have everything, including the cash from your house. We have it upstairs. This is wrong. This is torture. No, no, no. Torture is your way promising to save a person's life only to steal their money and then leave him to die.
Valentino, follow my instructions if you want to live. There are more than five pounds of marrow in the human body. All you need is three ounces. There's more than enough in your femur. Just suction it out. It'll be transferred to that device right there, and it'll deactivate the saw around your neck. And please, don't hesitate. Because your time is prescribed. No. no. Now, refusing to play the game is not an option. If you refuse, you'll remain in this room forever. You'll make it, so long as you keep your head. John, please. This is not right. Not right? A lecture in moral decency from you. You've all gotten rich by telling people that you could save their lives. You could not. But can you save your own? It's not that. Perhaps. But in it, there is method. Please, John. For God's sake. I'm begging you. Peterson, this is Sears. I'm going to fucking kill you. That's not how we do things. And how do you do things? You guys are fucking sick. We're sick. These people kill with false hope. work of yours to end with us? Why won't you let me help? Game drinks on. as I do. People will say almost anything to save their own life. Yeah, but her father's real. We both know that. What if there is something he can do to help you? <sighs> Great. So what, we finish the game, you die and that's it? Amanda, the reality is I'm dying. I am dying. 
you have to face that. But our work's not gonna end. And I'm trust trusting you. Carry on. But I'm not you. Who don't appreciate life don't deserve life do you remember who said that my teacher my mentor and now he's just an old man who's giving up <laughs> then fight i won't give up <sighs> i hear you We have a job to do. We're running out of time. I want you to go and free Mr. Sears and see if he'll play by the rules. Guess we're both running out of time, huh? Is he your father? <laughs> My father was a criminal. drug addict. He molested. That's their name, not mine. John saved me. He made me see the significance of life. I've read about your murders. Don't murder. That's bullshit. You talk about cleansing the world or some crap, but that's not true, is it? If it were, you'd take my offer and let my father heal you. The truth is that you can't live with what you've done. This is your test, Sears. Don't fail it. So you're taking the easy way out by letting yourself die. You're a murderer, John. I'm just a healer. <laughs> right. And John Wayne Gacy was just a clown. 
you're right about me. I'm a huge disappointment to my father. A great scientist. Horrible dad. I grifted off his name. Shitting on his legacy was just a bonus. I live with that. I rob. And I steal. And I cheat. Money that's about to go to some government or someone's spoiled children, I don't care. I admit it. Why can't you admit to what you really are? You know, I really should have seen you coming. I played so many games, and here I got played. Played. And now you want revenge. You're wrong about that. There's no shame in that, John. There's no shame. Why can't you admit it to yourself? I think that if you did, you'd realize that what you've actually done, what you've always done, and what you're doing right now, that it's a lie. I once told you we're not so different, you and I, John, and I was right. We are liars. Both of us. The only difference? I'm... I'm not a psychopath. Take a look around the fucking room, John! It's a slaughterhouse in here! How can you justify this? I don't have to justify it. Anything to you. John, John, please. Please listen. Let me help you. Let my father save you. I swear on my life. Well, soon we'll find out if you have a life to swear on, all right? Gabriella. No. no. It's time. <laughs> Please don't, please don't, please don't make him do it. Please do something, tell him. Please, 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 So tell me, John, you've been doing this for a very long time, haven't you? How did I stop you? Am I just that good? Don't flatter yourself. You two know exactly how to prey upon sick people like me. This is Cecilia Peterson. I'm currently working in Mexico. Oslo has become too difficult for us. We have a team of specialists here who share our belief in the Peterson methods and I've scheduled a group of eligible patients to start treatment a week from now, if you're interested. Yes, I'm interested. I just had a lapse in judgment, that's all. Yeah, I agree. For a guy as smart as you are, John, you kind of overplayed your hand here, wouldn't you say? <laughs> 